The vector cross product is another way of multiplying vectors which returns another vector, whereas the dot product returns a scalar. Now the magnitude of this vector is equal to the magnitude of V multiplied by the perpendicular component of W, which is the magnitude of W by sine theta, where theta is the angle between the vectors. And because it's a magnitude, we take the absolute value of sine theta. So you can see that geometrically, the cross product gives the area of the parallelogram between those vectors. So basically the base by the height of the parallelogram. And the direction of this vector is equal to the sine magnitude determined by sine theta multiplied by the unit vector in the z direction. So where v and w have components in the xy plane, the direction of r is along the z axis, as indicated by the unit vector k. The right hand rule can be used to visualize the vector cross product. So suppose we want to cross vector v with w. Well what you do is take your right hand and put the bottom of your right hand in the plane of vector v and w and curl your fingers from the first vector v to the second vector w involved in the cross product. So this is a visual of doing that. And your thumb points in the direction of the resulting vector r. Now in contrast, if you want to cross w with v, you would curl your fingers from the first vector w to the second vector v, which is shown over here using your right hand. So therefore in this case, the resulting vector r points downwards. So therefore the cross product is not commutative and try to visualize the cross product between j and k by following the same procedure where you curl your fingers from j to k as indicated by this picture of your right hand with the resulting vector points in the direction of i. Suppose we have vectors v and w in the xy plane which can be represented using the following components. Well the cross product between these vectors can be calculated using the determinant of a matrix. So in the first row we write the unit direction vectors. And in the subsequent rows, we write the components of vectors v and w. So expanding out the determinant, we have each unit vector multiplied by the determinant of the minor matrix, which consists of the elements in the other columns. And then we have minus the vector j by the determinant of the minor matrix in the other columns. And similarly for k, so the determinants are calculated by multiplying these two elements and then subtracting the product of these two elements. And that's done for every matrix, which gives the following result. So therefore these terms are all zero, and the resulting vector r is as follows. So it only has a component that's perpendicular to both vectors v and w, so it must point in the z direction. Let's do a simple proof of the cross product in two dimensions. So here we've evaluated the cross product of vectors v and w using the determinant method that we've already covered, where both vectors are the following components. And if vectors v and w have the following angles to the horizontal axis, then we can use trigonometry to rewrite these components. And now we can factor out the magnitude of v and w, and using our trig identity, we obtain the following expression. And theta w minus theta v is simply the angle theta between the vectors. Given the vectors omega and r, let's calculate the following cross product. So using the determinant method, we put the unit vectors in the first row, and the components of each vector involved in the cross product in the following rows. And now we can calculate the product of each unit vector with the determinants of the minor matrices, which have a components that are not in the column of that unit vector. Which gives the following result. And you'll notice that this is the tangent vector resulting from the cross product of the angular velocity with the radial vector in circular motion. And now I'll leave it for you as an exercise to check that this vector is perpendicular to both of these vectors involved in the cross product by taking its dot product with each of those vectors, which should be zero. A torque, or the moment of a force, about a point O, which is at a distance to a point P, where the force is applied, is equal to the cross product between a radial vector and the force. So we can resolve the force into components that are perpendicular and parallel to the radial vector. And using the distributive property of the cross product, well the cross product between two vectors that are parallel is zero. And the magnitude of the torque vector is equal to the magnitude of the radial vector by the magnitude of the perpendicular vector, which is the magnitude of f by sine of the angle between them. And we take the absolute value because we're looking at a magnitude. So applying the right hand rule, well you can place a perpendicular vector 
at the origin. So if you use your right hand and curl your fingers from R to the perpendicular component of F, then the resultant torque vector points in a positive Z direction in this case and produces an anti-clockwise rotation about O. We can conveniently choose a radial vector from a pivot that's perpendicular to the line of action of a force. So recalling that the torque is the cross product between R and F and the magnitude is RF sine theta. Well in this case the radial vector is perpendicular to the line of action of the force so theta is pi on 2. And therefore the magnitude of the torque is simply RF. So in this case R is the moment arm which is the distance between the pivot point and the line of action of the force. So this is useful for example where we have this socket wrench and we're trying to tighten a bolt and we apply a force on the wrench and draw a vector from the pivot point to the line of action of the force. So in this case if you use the right hand rule this force is going to produce a clockwise torque to tighten that bolt and therefore the torque vector points inside the screen. So this can be seen if you place the force vector at the tail of the radial vector. Consider a rigid body and rigid bodies don't deform but retain their shape under applied forces. And if this rigid body is connected to a hinge then the force of weight acting through its center of mass is going to produce a torque that's going to cause it to rotate. And this hinge is like a door hinge so it stops the rigid body from translating and therefore it's going to have a reaction that's equal to the force of weight. So force equilibrium is satisfied but here rotational equilibrium is not satisfied. So the sum of torques is not zero. So therefore to put this rigid body in rotational equilibrium you'd put it on some surface to support it at one side and therefore this here would produce a reaction force so we'll call that the right hand force and this produces a torque about the hinge that opposes the torque due to the force of weight to put that rigid body in rotational equilibrium and therefore if you have a reaction force on the right then the reaction force on the left is going to be smaller to keep that rigid body in force equilibrium. A 2 kilo rigid block in static equilibrium is attached to a massless cable pulley system and we're asked to find the force in cable BC. So what we'll do first is take a free body of the block and draw all the forces acting on it where the force of weight acts through the center of mass of this block. Now because we're asked to find the force in cable BC we'll take a sum of torques about a point where the line of action of the unknown forces passes through. So therefore these forces produce no torque about this point. And by rotational equilibrium the sum of torques about point P must be zero. And we can resolve this force into horizontal and vertical components and you can use the right hand rule to determine the torque contributions from each of these forces. So for the force of weight it's going to produce a counterclockwise torque with the moment arm of 0.1 and similarly for the other two forces and the net torque must be zero for static equilibrium to be satisfied and now you can solve for the force in cable BC. The moment of inertia is the property of a rigid body or a system of particles that resists rotations due to an applied torque and we'll see that when we look at the rotational analog of Newton's second law. Now suppose we have an axis that's perpendicular to this body which we approximate as a system of particles in the xy plane. Then the moment of inertia of this particle about this axis is the mass of that particle or the radial distance from that axis squared. And then summing over the number of particles we obtain the moment of inertia of the system of particles about this z-axis passing through point P. Now we define the moment of inertia of a system of particles about a z-axis passing through point P as the sum over the mass of each particle multiplied by the squared distance of that particle to the axis. So if we take the limit as n approaches infinity then we obtain a moment of inertia for the continuous body which is the integral of r squared with respect to the mass. And we determine an expression for the differential mass using the mass density of the continuous body, which we'll see in a few example problems. We have a system of three particles, each with a mass m, which are attached to massless rigid links. And we're asked to find the moment of inertia about the local z-axis passing through particle a. So this axis points out of the screen. And this is the definition for the moment of inertia for a system of particles. So the moment of inertia of particle A is as follows. And for particle B and for particle C, the radial distance to that axis is obtained using Pythagoras' theorem. 
So therefore we have mass by root to r squared squared, which gives the following result. Let's find a moment of inertia about an axis passing through the center of mass of this rod, which has a uniform density. So we know that the center of mass is in the middle of the rod. And a moment of inertia about this z-axis which points outside the screen is equal to the integral of the square of the radial distance from each element of mass to this axis with respect to the mass. So dm in this case is the density by the cross-sectional area of the rod multiplied by the thickness of that differential element. And we divide this over the total mass of the rod to get an expression for the moment of inertia in terms of the mass. And doing some cancellations, we can write the differential mass as follows. And then we can replace r with x, where we're integrating with respect to x. And here we integrate from minus l on 2 to l on 2. And evaluating this integral, you should get ml squared on 12. Let's find a moment of inertia of a thin rod with a non-uniform density about an axis passing through point O. So recalling the definition for the moment of inertia, which we'll write in terms of the x variable, where x is the distance to an element of mass, dm. So again we can write the differential mass element using the linear density by dx. And then substituting for dm and lambda, we obtain the following expression. And we integrate from 0 to L, and if you evaluate this integral, you'll get the following result. Now we can write this in terms of the mass by integrating the density function with respect to x from 0 to L. And if you evaluate this integral, you get the following expression. So we can write L cubed in terms of the mass. And then substituting for L cubed, we get 3 fifths m by L squared. Let's find the moment of inertia of a thin ring with a radius r about its axis, which points out of the plane. So recalling the definition for the moment of inertia, so in this case we can choose our differential mass element as some slice of that ring. So this angle is d theta. So we can write a differential mass as a linear density by r d theta, and divide this by the total mass. And if we make some cancellations, and multiply through by m, we can write dm and integrate from theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi. So we recognize that the radius is constant, and therefore we can take all the constants outside the integral. So therefore the moment of inertia evaluates the mr squared. Let's find the moment of inertia of this disk, which has a radius r about its axis, which is perpendicular to the plane. So using the definition of the moment of inertia, well we break up this disk into infinitely thin rings and the radial distance of that ring from the center is r, and the thickness of the ring is dr. So therefore the area of that ring is 2 pi r dr, and then multiplying that by the aerial density gives us a differential mass. And then dividing through by the total mass, which is the aerial density by the area of the disk, and doing some cancellations, we can now write dm as follows. So this becomes r cubed, and taking the constant outside the integral, and integrating from r equals 0 to r, the moment of inertia evaluates the mr squared on 2. Let's find the moment of inertia of this annular ring about its axis, which points in the z direction. So what we do is break this up into infinitely thin rings with a distance of r from the center and a thickness of dr. And the moment of inertia is defined as follows. Therefore dm is the aerial density by the area of that ring, which is a circumference by the thickness. And we'll divide by m to write dm in terms of m. So m is equal to the aerial density by the area of the annular ring. And after doing some cancellations and multiplying through by m, we can substitute for dm. And we integrate from r0 to r. And now you can do some simplification. Take the constants outside the integral and then evaluate the integral and post your answer in the comments. Let's find the moment of inertia of this cylinder about its axis, which passes through the center of mass. So designating the radius as r, and the radial distance to this infinitely thin ring as r, and giving this ring a thickness dr, and the moment of inertia is defined as follows. So in this case we'll break the cylinder into infinitely thin shells, 
and these shells have a volume of 2 pi r by dr and that's multiplied by the length of the cylinder. And multiplying the density gives us the differential mass. And then dividing by the mass of the cylinder, well that's equal to the density by the volume of the cylinder. And now we can do some cancellations, substitute for dm, and then integrate from naught to r. And if you make some simplifications, then taking the constants outside the integral, and then evaluating this integral, you get the following moment of inertia. If we know the moment of inertia of a planar rigid body about a perpendicular axis passing through its center of mass, then we can find the moment of inertia about any other z axis, and that axis is parallel to zc. So if we start with the definition of the moment of inertia, well we can do some vector algebra to rewrite this using the dot product. And if we use vector addition, we can rewrite r. And expanding the dot product, and the dot product of a vector with itself is the same as the squared magnitude of that vector. And now we can take the constants outside the integral. So we recognize that this term is the moment of inertia about the center of mass. And for this term, the integral evaluates the total mass of the body. And this integral here evaluates to zero because the integral of the radial distance at the center of mass over the entire body are going to cancel each other out. So we end up with the following general result. Let's find the moment of inertia of this rod about the z-axis passing through point O using the known moment of inertia about a z-axis passing through the center of mass, which is in the middle of the rod. So these axes are parallel, so we can use the parallel axis theorem. So we've derived this term previously, and we add the mass by the length on 2 squared. And if you do the algebra, you'll get ml squared on 3. Let's find the moment of inertia of this rod about a z-axis passing through point A. Well, we know the moment of inertia of the rod about a z-axis passing through the center of mass. And because these axes are parallel, we can use the parallel axis theorem, where the squared distance is from the z-axis passing through the center of mass to the z-axis through A, which can be obtained using Pythagoras' theorem. So we've previously derived the moment of inertia about the center of mass, and d squared is as follows. And doing the algebra, we obtain the following result. Suppose we have a rigid body in the xy plane, and it rotates about a fixed z-axis passing through P. So the green line retains the same length and just rotates to the red line. So a particle that would be sitting at the end of this line would displace an arc length of ds, as any particle in that rigid body would basically be undergoing circular motion. And using the arc length formula, and dividing through by dt, we have a relationship between a tangent velocity and the angular velocity. And this here is basically the magnitude of the cross product between the angular velocity and the radial vector. So effectively this tangent vector is perpendicular to both vectors omega and r. And if we differentiate, we obtain a tangent acceleration, which is r by the angular acceleration, or the magnitude of the cross product between the angular acceleration and r. And of course we'd have a centripetal acceleration to keep that particle traveling along a circular path. A rigid body may undergo translation and also rotation. And typically we look at the translation of its center of mass, which we treat as a particle, and we've derived the big five kinematic equations for uniform acceleration by integrating the velocity and the acceleration equations. And similarly, if we integrate the differential equations for angular velocity and angular acceleration, we get the big five kinematic equations that describe the rotation of the rigid body, where the angular acceleration is uniform. And as we did to derive the translation equations, I encourage you to derive the big five kinematic equations for rotational motion using the geometry of these graphs. And post your questions in the comments. A disk is rotating at an angular velocity of 4 radians per second about its axes, Calculate the magnitude and components of the instantaneous tangent velocity at a point on the rim. So the tangent velocity is the cross product between the angular velocity and the radial vector. So using the determinant method, we write the angular velocity components in the first row and the radial vector components in the second row, which you can obtain using trigonometry. So that's going to give you the horizontal and vertical components of the tangent velocity. And to obtain a magnitude, well, you simply multiply r by omega. And for part b, 
the average angular acceleration is equal to the change in angular velocity on the change in time, which is the final minus the initial angular velocity on 3 seconds. And this will give you an answer in radians per second squared. And because it's negative, the average angular acceleration is clockwise and pointing inside the screen. A tyre has a diameter of 35 centimetres, and at point A, the tangent velocity is 15 metres per second at the instant shown. And part A asks for the velocity at point B on the rim. Well, we know that VA is r omega, with the angular velocities uniform on that planar rigid body and points out of the screen. So given VA and the radial distance to point A, we can calculate omega, and then a tangent velocity at B is equal to the radial distance to B, which is half the diameter, multiplied by the angular velocity which we obtained from this equation. Now in part B, if the tyre started from rest, how much time would point A take to traverse an angle of pi radians? And assume a constant angular acceleration, and we also know the angular velocity from the previous part of the question, so therefore we use the following equation from the big five kinematic equations for a uniform angular acceleration. You'll be able to solve for the time. A tyre has a diameter of 35 centimetres and rotates with an angular acceleration that depends on time. Now derive an expression for the tangent velocity at a point located at some distance r from the centre of mass. So we know that vt is r omega, and we're given an initial angular velocity of 4 radians per second. So using the differential equation that relates the angular velocity to the angular acceleration, we substitute for the angular acceleration, then separate the variables, then integrate both sides, so from the initial to the current angular velocity, and from the initial time of 0, to the current time t. Then from that, you'll get an expression for the angular velocity as a function of time, which you can substitute into this equation to get an expression for the tangent velocity. Consider a disc rolling down an inclined plane. So the contact point initially here, when a disc rotates, ends up at the top, and the center of mass of the disc translates to this point. Now the no-slip condition means that the change in the position of the center of mass is equal to the arc length from the new contact point to the initial contact point. And delta S can be determined using the arc length formula, and then dividing through by delta T, and then taking the limit as delta T approaches zero, we have a relationship between the velocity of the center of mass and the tangent velocity at the contact point. And if we differentiate this with respect to time, so this rolling motion can be visualized as the superposition of the translation of the center of mass, and then plus the rotation, so we have the rotational velocity at the contact point, and that's equal to the rolling motion. So we see that at a particular instant in time, the instantaneous velocity at the contact point is zero. Let's derive the rotational analog of Newton's second law. And this equation applies for a rigid body that's rotating about a fixed axis, or where the rigid body is free and rotating about its center of mass. So we can write Newton's second law for particle i, and then taking a cross product with the radial vector gives the torque. And we can write the acceleration in terms of the angular acceleration, where the angular acceleration is in the direction of the torque, and it's a vector that points out of the screen. And because the mass is a scalar, we also took it out of the cross product. And I encourage you to evaluate these cross products, and you'll end up with the following vector. Because crossing alpha with the radial vector gives a perpendicular vector to both vectors, and then crossing with RPI again gives a vector that points out of the plane. So now we can write this as a scalar, and take the sum over all the particles in the rigid body. And if you take the limit as n approaches infinity from both sides, you'll end up with the net torque about p, and the angular acceleration is uniform on the entire rigid body. We can draw rigid body diagrams, which help us to apply the rotational analog of Newton's second law, by identifying the position of each force on the rigid body. So for this first example on rolling motion, we have the force of weight, the normal force, and the force of static friction, where there's no slip. And for this rotating rigid bar, we have an oblique force, so we must have a horizontal and vertical reaction to prevent the bar from translating at the hinge, and we have a force of weight through the center of mass. And for this cable pulley system, where we consider the geometry of the pulley, we can split this up into three bodies, and then draw the forces acting on each body. And also a reaction at the hinge to prevent that pulley from translating at the hinge. A bar is restrained at its base and subjected to a force. 
write the linear accelerations at points A and C in terms of the following variables. What we'll do is draw the forces acting on this rigid body, which has a mass M. So there must be reaction forces preventing the bar from translating at the hinge. So if we take a sum of torques about the hinge, only the horizontal component of this force contributes a torque. And that's equal to the moment of inertia of the bar about its endpoint by the angular acceleration. And now we can solve for alpha. And therefore, to find the linear acceleration at A and C, we can use the following relationships. And post any questions you have in the comments. A rigid bar is sitting freely on a horizontal frictionless tabletop and subjected to a force as shown. Write the linear accelerations at the following points in terms of the force and the mass of the bar. So this problem tells us that the force of weight and the normal force act in and out of the plane. So that means the bar is in equilibrium in the z direction. Now applying Newton's second law in the horizontal direction, and that gives us the acceleration of the center of mass due to translation. And now we apply the rotational analog of Newton's second law, where the torque is taken about the center of mass, where the bar is free to rotate. So the torque, which is the force by the moment arm, is equal to the moment of inertia of the bar about the axes passing through the center of mass by the angular acceleration. And from that we can calculate the acceleration at each point by superimposing the translational and rotational components. And the acceleration at C is the acceleration of the center of mass, which is purely translational. We can apply Newton's second law for translational and rotational motion to a dynamic system that's translating and rotating. And where we have rolling without slip, we derive the following kinematic relationship between the translational velocity of the center of mass and the angular velocity of the disk. And the same thing for the acceleration of the center of mass and under the no-slip condition, we have a force of static friction because the instantaneous velocity of the contact point is zero. And we have a force of weight acting through the center of mass and also a normal force, and the disk has a radius r. Now applying Newton's second law for translational motion in the direction parallel to the plane, and applying Newton's law for rotational motion, by taking the torques about the center of mass, and the moment of inertia of the disk about the center of mass is as follows. And now using this relationship, and then dividing through by r, and then adding these equations together, from which we obtain an expression for the acceleration of the center of mass. Two blocks are attached to a fixed cable pulley system, and the masses of the blocks and the pulley are given, as well as the radius of the pulley. And we're asked to calculate the forces in the cable and angular acceleration of the pulley, assuming no slip between the cable and pulley. So if we isolate the bodies and draw the forces acting on each body, and because the blue block is heavier, we expect the accelerations as follows. Now applying Newton's second law on each block, and note that we'd also have a force of weight on the pulley and a reaction force because the hinge prevents the pulley from translating. But when we apply the rotational analog of Newton's second law and take the torque about the center of mass of the pulley disc, we eliminate the torques produced by these forces. And note that because there's no slip between the cable and pulley, the accelerations at these points on the pulley are the same as the accelerations of the blocks. So therefore we can relate them to the angular accelerations as follows. And now you can solve for the angular acceleration and tension forces in the cable. A cylinder with a mass m and radius r unrolls vertically from three strings tied at one end. Find the acceleration of the center of mass. Taking a free body of the cylinder, we have the tension forces in the strings and the force of weight of the cylinder. And if we observe these forces in the plane of the cross section of the cylinder, they would look something like this. So now we can apply Newton's second law for translation to get the acceleration of the center of mass and we can apply the rotational analog of Newton's second law to obtain an expression for the angular acceleration. Then dividing through by r and adding these equations together and assuming the no-slip condition, the acceleration of the center of mass is related to the angular acceleration as follows. So therefore substituting for alpha, we'll get the acceleration of the center of mass as follows. Recall Newton's second law for the rotation about a fixed axis and the kinematic relationships for angular velocity and angular acceleration. Well, we can eliminate dt from these relationships to obtain the following expression and then substituting for the angular acceleration and separating the variables. And now we can integrate both sides of this equation where the moment of inertia is constant. So this is the rotational work on the left-hand side of the equation 
which is equal to the change in rotational kinetic energy. Previously we derived an expression relating the rotational work due to the rotational kinetic energy of a rigid body rotating about a fixed axis. Well in this case we consider a rigid body that's free to translate and rotate in the plane. So what we have is the following expression for the rotational work due to the net torque about the centre of mass. And that's equal to the change in rotational kinetic energy when we take the moment of inertia about the centre of mass. And similarly, we had an expression for the translational work, so that would be due to the net force acting on the body. And that's equal to the change in translational kinetic energy. So we have the mass by the velocity of the centre of mass of the rigid body, where the squared magnitude is the same as the dot product between the velocity vector and itself. So in this case, we have a work kinetic energy relationship for rotation and translation, which is applicable to cases such as rolling motion of a rigid body. A disc has a mass of 10 kilos and a radius of 3 centimeters, and it's initially at rest and subjected to the following torque, which is a function of the angle theta. And we're asked to find the velocity of point P on the rim if it traverses 12 radians. Well, the work done by the torque is the integral from the initial to the final angle of the torque with respect to theta. And that's equal to the change in kinetic energy of the disc, which is a half by the moment of inertia about the center of mass by the change in the square of angular velocity. And recall that the velocity is related to the angular velocity by the radial distance from the point where the torque is applied by the magnitude of the angular velocity. So if we evaluate the integral on the left hand side and on the right hand side where the disc is initially at rest, and if we take our reference angle of theta naught is equal to zero, and we obtain the following expression for the angular velocity. So you can substitute the given values to find the angular velocity, then multiply it by r to get the velocity at point p. A bar is initially at rest and hinged at point p, and a variable force is applied at the base, where a is a constant, and we're asked to write an expression for the angular velocity as a function of theta, assuming the force remains perpendicular to the bar. So recall the rotational work kinetic energy theorem, so given the bar is initially at rest, and the moment of inertia of the bar about its end point is as follows. And we have a force of weight acting through the bar at the center of mass. So at some angular position of the bar, theta, it looks something like this. So therefore the net torque, so the torque due to the force acting at the end of the bar is as follows, where the moment arm is L, and the torque due to the force of weight is mgl on 2 sine theta. And now you can evaluate the integral solve for the angular velocity and post your answer in the comments. We can apply the conservation of energy to some types of rigid body motion, such as rolling motion without slip, where the following forces are acting on the body. And because we have a static friction force, so there's no energy dissipated because there's no slip between the surfaces, or the instantaneous velocity of the contact point is zero, then the total mechanical energy is conserved. So if we have the initial and final position of the body, then the total initial energy consisting of kinetic and potential energy terms is equal to the total final energy. And in rolling motion without slip, the total kinetic energy consists of a translational term and a rotational term. Well, you can take advantage of the following relationship as we've derived for rolling without slip. Now the potential energy on the other hand depends on the mass of the body, the gravitational acceleration, which is uniform on the body, and the height above some datum. So for example, if we choose our datum point then we take the height as the vertical distance from this datum point to the center of mass of the body. A disc with a mass of 2 kilos and radius of 2 centimeters starts from rest and rolls down an inclined plane without slipping. Determine the velocity if the body travels 5 meters as shown. So let's apply the conservation of mechanical energy. So given the body starts from rest, this is zero. And if we take the final center of mass as our reference point, then the initial potential energy can be written as follows. So therefore the final potential energy is zero because we took the reference point at the final center of mass. So the final kinetic energy consists of translational and rotational terms. So for rolling motion without slip, we had the following relationship. And knowing the moment of inertia of the disc about its center of mass, and substituting for the velocity of the center of mass in this term, then we get the following expression, which we can solve for the velocity of the center of mass. And you can determine an expression for h using trigonometry. Two blocks are attached to a fixed pulley using a massless cable, and block one's released from rest. 
find the speed of the block at the instant before it hits the ground, assuming no slip between the cable and pulley. So applying a conservation of energy to the entire system, mass 1 has an initial potential energy, and that's equal to the final energy of the system before the blue block hits the ground. So for that to happen, mass 2 will move up a height h. And we add the kinetic energy of both masses, which are travelling at some speed v. And then plus the rotational kinetic energy of the pulley, which is going to have the same speed at the rim, due to the no-slip condition. So therefore v is related to omega using this expression. And note that we didn't include the potential energy of the pulley, because it's fixed. So therefore the potential energy terms will cancel on both sides of the equation. And now you can do some cancellations and solve for the speed of the block before it hits the ground. We previously defined the rotational analog of Newton's second law for rigid body rotation about a fixed axis. And using the following kinematic relationship between the angular acceleration and angular velocity, and separating the variables, and integrating both sides of this equation, we have an expression for the angular impulse, or the rotational impulse, is equal to the change in angular momentum on the right-hand side, which for a constant moment of inertia, this evaluates at the following expression. And the following quantity is known as the spin angular momentum, because the rigid body is spinning or rotating about a fixed axis. We can write the rotational analog of Newton's second law for rigid body rotation about a fixed axis in the following form. So on the right hand side, we have the instantaneous rate of change of angular momentum with respect to time. And that's equal to the net torque about a perpendicular axis passing through point P. So from this equation, we can obtain a differential definition of the angular impulse, and then integrating both sides of this equation, we get back the relationship between the rotational impulse and the change in angular momentum on the right hand side, where the angular momentum is defined as follows. Recall that the linear momentum of a particle with a mass m, and if we define a vector r from an axis passing through point p to the particle, and we take the cross product on both sides, then we have a relationship between the angular momentum and the linear momentum of the particle, which can be written as follows. Now in two dimensions, we can observe that the perpendicular component of the velocity vector contributes to the angular momentum. So let's rewrite this expression using the distributive property of the cross product. So this term here is zero, and we can now write this magnitude of the cross product as rv perpendicular. And in two dimensions, this vector is going to point in or out of the plane then by the right hand rule, the angular momentum vector is going to point in the screen. We can represent it using the tail of a vector as follows. And this is known as the orbital angular momentum of the particle about the axis passing through point P. A hinged bar with a mass m is subjected to an impulse, which is a constant force over a time t, and we're asked to write an expression for the angular velocity in terms of the following variable, assuming the bar is initially at rest. So recall that the angular impulse momentum equation, where the angular impulse, which consists of the net torque about the hinge, is equal to the change in angular momentum. And because the bar is initially at rest, we can get rid of this term. And we can use the scalar components of this equation, because we're working in two dimensions. So we know that the torque and angular momentum is going to point in and out of the screen, or in the z direction. Now given that the force is constant and applied over a time t, then we simply multiply the force by the moment arm by t to get the angular impulse. And the moment of inertia of the bar about the hinge is ml squared on 3. And now we can solve this for the angular velocity, which is the angular velocity just as the bar begins to take off. A bar with a mass m is resting on a frictionless surface and subjected to an impulse, which is a constant force applied over a time t and we're asked to write an expression for the angular velocity in terms of the following variables. So using the angular impulse momentum equation, and because the bar is initially at rest, we can get rid of this term. So here the bar is going to rotate about its center of mass. And the angular impulse is simply the force by the moment arm multiplied by t. And the moment of inertia about the center of mass is ml squared on 12. And now we can solve for the angular velocity, which is the angular velocity of the bar just as it begins to rotate. We have a general case where a rigid body 
is free to translate and rotate, and we take the torque about a point other than the center of mass. And in this case, because the body can translate and rotate, we can split this up into the spin angular momentum plus the orbital angular momentum. So effectively, the rigid body is free, so it's going to spin or rotate about its center of mass. And due to the linear momentum of the center of mass, the rigid body is also going to orbit around P. So this is the orbital angular momentum. Now if the net torque about P is zero, so for example, with a line of action of the forces passes through P, then we obtain the following expression for the change in angular momentum. And therefore we can write the initial angular momentum on the left hand side is equal to the final angular momentum on the right hand side. Well, angular momentum is conserved if the net torque about the given point is zero. Recall that the conservation of angular momentum states that the initial angular momentum of rigid body is equal to the final angular momentum and the condition for this to hold was that the net torque acting on the body about a particular point is zero. So the conservation of angular momentum can be extended to a system of particles and rigid bodies. So here if we take the system as a bullet and a ballistic pendulum and we ignore the force of weight on the bullet then in this initial configuration the bullet has a linear momentum and we have a force of weight acting through the center of mass of this pendulum. Then a good point to take the torque about is the hinge because the net torque acting on this system is then zero and we can apply the conservation of angular momentum to the system. And in the final configuration, the bullet impacts this pendulum by Newton's third law, the net external torque acting on this system, about point P is still zero. So we can still apply the conservation of angular momentum to this problem. A bullet is fired into an impact testing assembly and the bullet, bar and discs have the following masses. And we're asked to determine the angular velocity of the assembly. So if we take the bullet and the pendulum as a system, then we can take the torque about this hinge. Because the lines of action of the forces of weight of the components in this system all pass through this point, and therefore there's no external torque acting on the system. And think about why we can ignore the contribution of the weight of the bullet to the external torque. So therefore the orbital angular momentum of the bullet, which is the linear momentum of the bullet, by the moment arm from the pivot. And that's converted into a spin angular momentum of the assembly. So at this point the bullet is embedded into this mass. So therefore the moment of inertia of the assembly about the pivot after impact can be written as follows. Then simplifying this expression you can solve for the angular velocity of the system. 